As we keep on driving on our tour, we look out the window in the distance, we can see the blue dot of our planet shrinking. We've always speculated on worlds beyond our own. We look into the murky black, vast, unknowable, and fill in the gaps with stories and fictions. These are not territories on our expedition that um, well, these, these are, sorry, territories in our expedition that offer a route of escape, but they also afford us a critical distance from which to reevaluate ourselves and the place from which we've come. Um, we're going to start in the planets of good and evil where we meet Rick Carter, hand on the hyperdrive, ready to ferry us into the worlds of Star Wars The Force Awakens. Um, Rick needs no introduction, really. He's a multiple Academy Award winner, production designer, who has created the worlds of some of the most seminal films of recent times, including Avatar, Lincoln, uh, Back to the Future, and, of course, Star Wars, um, Force Awakens, that we're going to start to talk about tonight. Um, and uh, Rick and I, we're going to have a conversation again once, um, uh, as I said before, please um, tweet in any questions you have, um, and I'll endeavor to, to, to weave them into the discussion um, I wonder, Rick, uh, while the trailer is playing in the background, um, if you could start to introduce us to the to the world, your relationship to it, that'd be great. Um, when you say uh, uh, introduction to the world, and 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 we are off world, I think that's a good place to start. Um, and then emotionally, to try to um, address fear and wonder, and to uh, find a process um, that could perhaps um, take everything that you've heard so far and then projecting into the next group of people, but find a, 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 um, a way to travel there, knowing where you've just come from. That all sounds very abstract, but after David's talk, um, I feel liberated <laughs> <laughs> because he already took me, and I'm sure most of you, very deep and also very far out at the same time. And when he invoked uh, Alan Watts, who I would um, encourage anybody here to um, please explore, uh, he's a philosopher and entertainer from the um, late 60s, early 70s, who was a Zen master. Um, he was responsible for bringing a lot of the uh, information about the East and particularly uh, Buddhism uh, in the late 60s, which was so influential at that time. And of course, that informs George Lucas. Um, George Lucas was um, very much making a movie at the time in a, in a commercial way about the clash that he saw uh, between, in a sense, the Nazis and the hippies <laughs> through a Flash Gordon lens, but spoken from a point of view that actually articulated something that you can't see. And that's where Alan Watts comes in because Alan Watts will tell you that you can't see anything unless you can see the space around it. There's no such thing as form without that. And when your brain starts to go into that place where you start to realize that the very thing that was concrete to you is now only half the equation, what opens up potentially is the force. And the force is actually, as Steven Spielberg would say, uh, is intuition. How do, you, how do you communicate? How do we all uh, find a way collaboratively to interact? So for me, what I did on The Force Awakens, um, I was invited early on, even before J.J. Abrams came up aboard, uh, by Kathy Kennedy, and I had a meeting with uh, George Lucas. And I'm an old guy, I'm not as old as him, but I'm still old enough that um, I was around and had traveled around the world when he first uh, did his Star Wars movies. I'd already been out in the world quite a bit and had gone to Berkeley. Um, so our conversation had a lot to do with what is this transference that, that is going on in terms of, of this legacy that he's created and what's its purpose, why, why do it? And, we didn't get into too deep a philosophical uh, discussion, except for that he had an interesting point of view about how when he was younger, uh, the world was uh, all very um, 
close up and he could he could see everything very clearly and as he'd gotten older it was like taking the binoculars and turning them around and seeing them more in a distance and I think he felt uh, along the lines of, of as you would imagine Yoda would that there's a time when you must uh, give it up and he could have gone down another path which would be the the Darth Vader <laughs> Emperor path which is you have to bend reality to your will so what I did is I went up to uh, ILM and Lucasfilm and I um, I asked a simple question I grouped I got a group of artists together and I asked um, how strong is the force and then before anybody could raise their hand and say well it's <laughs> I said you can't answer that question yet we can only show it so the way I'd like to kind of engage this abstract off-world uh, conversation about um, Star Wars and The Force Awakens is to go to the source and, and, and discuss the metaphor that for me The Force represents, which is a collaborative, interactive methodology for coming up with something that is bigger than the sum of the parts. And that's been my method over the years. And um, I can't really do anything. Uh, I was talking with, with Hannah, um, another production designer who's already presented, and, and I just wanted to um, convey to her that uh, I know that when I started off and started doing movies, um, I knew less than anybody had ever known when they got into certainly the union um, where you're supposed to know things. In fact, my mentor, um, he would say things like, kid, uh, if this was music, I can I can write the music, I can play all the instruments, I can conduct the orchestra, I can sell it on Tin Pan Alley. This was Richard Silbert, who'd, who'd worked with Mike Nichols and Roman Polanski in a lot of seminal movies in the late 60s and early 70s. And I was just, you know, a long-haired hippie, and, and I... I knew I couldn't do any of that, and I. But I knew about Joe Cocker, who was a it was a guy who who would fake playing the guitar while he was singing. See, I have a microphone in front of me. You know, you know she came in through the bathroom window, and he go like he was playing the guitar. I knew that that was going to be the only thing I could really do, and believe it or not, that is the only thing I've ever been able to do, which is to get in a group of people uh, with the director and with the artists and whoever it takes, and I've had to learn along the way, to try to inspire the level that we're trying to find. And that, that level, for me, is, a, is, a, is an emotional humanist level. So I can go into some of the specifics uh, of what you're seeing there, but I think more importantly for me, and I, I would hope for you, and then I'll please ask questions, because I know I can be very abstract, what I'd like to try to convey is that after 40 years, I still don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm still playing air guitar, and yet I've found that that conceptual space is a very important conceptual space. And when I was listening to David um, be able to articulate for himself first and foremost, and then convey that to you, there were so many levels that I thought he's thought out and he's actually identified and even if you can't follow everything exactly, like he's not, he's an alchemist. He's not literally necessarily trying to create the thing that functions as much as illuminate the path to how to think about it. And that hopefully what that does is that you've got gaps in that type of thinking. It's a creative thing and that in that gap, the only thing that connects it is your intuition and where are you gonna go next? And that literally is the force. So when it comes to, let's say, an image of Ray um, discovering her powers and how she's force sensitive and, and where does she come from, and we still don't know. And I can assure you that we did um, The Force Awakens, um, we didn't know who she was. And what's interesting about that whole process is to create a multi-million dollar extravaganza and not know from moment to moment. In fact, I would always laugh um, like four or five months in when we were still struggling to find some very basic levels. And I'd say out there they think Star Wars is something and in here I kn we know we don't have it yet. And as I again uh, had just mentioned to Hannah, which was um, one of the, the breakthrough moments for me with Steven Spielberg was one time when Jurassic Park, when we didn't know what we were doing, and we didn't know that the CG dinosaurs would work, to say, 
we really don't know what the fuck we're doing, do we? And he went, that's the point. And then as Zemeckis would say, if, if, if it was known, then anybody can do it. So there's, there's something at the core here that's, that's about the force, and it's trusting your intuition, and it's right there in the Star Wars movies, obviously, right? Because it's, it's um, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi saying, Luke, you know, take away your visor, just trust your, your, your instincts, uh, your, your feelings. So just to give one last little thing that maybe will connect with uh, The Force Awakens, then please ask anything, and I'll hopefully I'll give you some insight, <coughs> I hope, um, or outsight. Um, the threat in The Force Awakens, uh, as in I, you know, what, what's, the, what, what's the worst that the dark side can do? They can breathe heavily, they can come in with their, you know, their, their, their guns or whatever. <laughs> you know, they can terrify us, you know, you know, I'm not afraid, well, you will be. Well, what, what actually does that mean? As, as, as something that you would want in a movie. And it was actually Dennis Muren who'd worked on the first Star Wars as a, a visual effects uh, supervisor. I asked a question in a round table. I said, what, what would actually frighten you? I mean, for real, it, within the metaphoric world of, of this galaxy a long time ago, far, far away, but sort of close. Um, and he said, well, I, if, if actually the, the, the dark side could take the light out of a star in the sky, that would be pretty impressive. Well, that's obviously what happened in The Force Awakens. That becomes the threat. That's what they're able to do. And then J.J. Abrams said, and we'll double down on that. We'll make that into a weapon. The, the power that they get from taking that light, they'll make it into a weapon. And I actually feel like on that level, that's part of what we're living through. We, we we're seeing things weaponized that we didn't think were even weapons. We didn't even know they were weapons. We can, we've seen flip arounds in, in, in information and all sorts of dark as light and light as dark, and you can't even go back to Orwell fully and get all the answers, but you can get some. So there's actually this kind of light that's, that's under threat, and that that which is dark doesn't just take it, it uses it somehow as power against you in a, in a dark way. So that was an interesting aspect to have a visual notion, a, 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 a vision that wasn't even illustrated yet, and then have that become right at the center of the movie. It's not an idea that was illustrated, it was the visual idea that w was the sort of fundamental level of, of what was fearful. Um, and then the wonder was that there was another way to think about it and to go into that world and discover something that was hopeful. And what was that and who was that? And so that's, that's in a sense, a very broad, I don't even know whether you can follow any of that, but it was all there in, in, in this imagery at the basis of it. Um, I mean, uh, thanks so much for, the, for that setup. Um, I wonder, we've been talking a lot with, with people on, on the panels throughout the evening about projects that, that grow out of various forms of source material. Obviously, Star Wars has an extraordinary backstory and a number of different production designers and concept artists have all had a crack at visualizing moments, components, and elements of that universe. Um, and I imagine a whole set of rules have been established um, that, that work with to the coherence of that world. Um, and, and again, to, to, to riff off um, uh, what David was talking about just before, um, you know, things like you know, th there are no or very few wheels in Star <laughs> Wars, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, up until uh, just a screenshot that, that was released recently. There was no paper in Star Wars, um, mm -hmm. but, but in Luke Skywalker, in the next, next film, there's, there's a bunch of books on right. Luke Skywalker's mm -hmm. desk. Um, uh, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the, those established rules and to what extent you were either ripping off them or breaking them or inventing your own set of rules as you start to reinvent the franchise with Force Awakens. It's interesting. I've never even thought about that. I, 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 I'm not very good with rules. Um, <laughs> meaning, I'm, uh, it's funny to not even recognize them. Um, I don't say that facetiously. I, uh, there are very obvious aesthetic um, decisions that were made early and that we then went back to. Um, and I think that the, the primary idea on that level would be that, that we actually 
um, those of us, uh, JJ, and, and who's much younger, but and myself, um, liked the way the first four, five, and six episodes were, and that the the amount of CG that was in the one, two, and three uh, broke a lot of, of of rules that I suppose, if I was to mean refer to as a rule, is that it just didn't feel that authentic. It didn't feel like it was grounded in places that you could actually be. So we tried to go back to that aesthetic that was based upon the, the hybrid, actually, that, that um, David um, uh, thought was you know, the shit <laughs> zone. And, and I think that that's a fair thing to say, too, by the way, because um, it's very difficult to, to, to meld these two worlds. But it's something that George Lucas had kind of done in the, in the pre-digital uh, world, but he'd, he'd gone to real places, so you felt that there was a kind of used, palpable sense of being in a, in a real place. Um, for me, it wasn't so much about uh, following the rules as going back to some of the ways I had learned to do films when I was younger, because I started in the analog era, so I would go out and, and try to find places that spoke to me. Um, and when I say spoke to me, I, I, I almost, feel like I'm auditioning locations at times where I'm almost out somewhere saying, well, who wants to be in the movie? You know, and then the locations start to present themselves, again, in a very subjective way, but it's that level that I need to be able to report back to the directors with. Because it's a collaboration, it's not just about a, an approval process or a checking off marks. I have to have my own intuitive reason why I'm, I'm responding to somewhere. So if I go to a desert like um, you know in, in Abu Dhabi or, or the, the 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 big one that's and it's actually going to play a role and I won't say too much but in eight is where uh, Luke was at the very end of the movie that that uh, that temple um, island that he was on uh, was an interesting uh, discovery process for myself because I was just looking for what we hadn't seen and thinking about it and I thought about an island that would be, be in the middle of the ocean, and then came upon this, I looked up Google, and I saw that picture and of an overview, and then I went out there, and it was just amazing, because it was an old fifth century uh, Coptic Christian uh, monastery where it literally embodies that pain and suffering and also enlightenment uh, of the monks who built all those steps all the way up, and. And it was, it was a, a foundation for me on an intuitive level of where we could end the movie. Uh, I don't think that answers your question about rules as much as it is foundations that we try to pay attention to. Yeah, I mean, maybe then um, another way of getting into that conversation is, is to talk about how um, uh, a lot of these ideas formulated throughout the process of the development of the, of the world, um, I've, I've read Previously, that you've spoken about the, the visualization process and how you were working with a lot of the concept artists, which are um, based um, uh, within Lucasfilm, um, and the, the creation of some of these images, like uh, what we're seeing behind us, we're switching between um, the concept art and then some of the um, stills that, that concept art generated. But you weren't illustrating scenes. That already existed. That's right. That, that through the process of actually making those images, you were developing and ideating um, in itself. Right? And I think that's the that's the key. Is um, there are often a lot of um, of uh, what's the word words to follow uh, if there's a script. Um, I think that Anne. Um, was very articulate um, on a level that I responded to was which was that she felt it so deeply and then also had to, in a sense, put away the words in order to get to the, the, the visuals that, she, that, 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 would, that would mean something to her and that she would see it somewhere. It's a constant subconscious process of searching until something presents itself and is revealed and that you can work with. So um, in, in terms of just that process, I, I refer to it as guided imagery because it's a type of therapy I've actually had, and it's it's really it's very powerful because you have a waking dream. You you close your eyes and you go into a place that you start talking and discussing what that place is, what you see, and step by step, 
and with a guide sometimes, you, you can um, find little, little fragments of things, and then if you explore them, they end up meaning something, and you can end up feeling very emotional about it, and it can actually be very therapeutic. Um, I've used that, as it's turned out, as a process of collaborative um, of image making where we'll, we'll discuss things, we'll look at things, and we'll ask questions. And I think that's the one thing that I thought was so great also with David's presentation when he shows art and he shows this cube with question marks. And you realize it's, that kind of is art. It, it, it's, it's this way of asking questions about our existence and coming up with our own private answers for that moment. But it's, it's not a literal process. And you think, well, well how is that going to help you when you go in to try to, to go with Steven Spielberg or Jim Cameron or any of those people that are so demanding in terms of what they want to put on the screen. And the funny thing is, is that that's how they are. And even though they've learned to concretize and be literal with certain parts of their direction, where they're really coming from, in fact, is, is quite abstract. So for instance, uh, um, Steven Spielberg is often, you know, uh, when he is delighted by an idea, he'll, he'll say, well, the, uh, some of my best ideas are not my own. It's fantastic. I mean, he can then take that on and make that part of his process. It doesn't take anything away from me. Then with Bob Zemeckis, I learned after a while that I would say things like, you know, as a reconnoiter, I'd have an idea, and he would, his eyes would bulge, and he'd say, well, what I thought you were going to say is, and he'd come up with a whole idea, like, and it would go right in the movie just the way he said it. And I'd said, were you thinking about that before I started talking? And he said, no, 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 just while you're talking. I, I started thinking that way. And then, so there's a level, right? And then with Stephen, again, because I've had so many encounters with him, sometimes we're in a conversation, and I'll go, oh, you're about to have a great idea because I can feel it. I can feel that the conversation in that collaborative mode is going somewhere beyond the two of us. Jim Cameron will come in because he's, he's very exacting and very and, 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 uh, and his vision is, is really something. He will, he will, he can draw, really draw well. So he'll, he'll uh, as Victor would uh, probably uh, say, he, he can come in and, and make everybody sort of, who's an artist, feel like, ugh, because he said, I can do everybody's job better than everybody here, right? And then I would laugh and I'd say, since I can't draw the way he can, I said, well, then why is there so much for everybody else here to do? <laughs> and he'd look at me like, what do you mean? And I said, well, because your vision's so big that if you just want to do one movie your whole life by yourself, you can do that. Or you need this process. You, so this, this collaborative thing that I'm coming back to again and again, and you could say, oh, it's all abstract. What does that mean? I, you haven't said anything. You haven't told me about making either, any one of these images. Well, you've had other people up here who have told you about that process. I'm just telling you that after 35 years of it, that for me, the most important part of it is what I learned in the very beginning. As Hannah said earlier, she said, oh, I feel like I'm in the first grade. I said, be in the first grade. Look at those movies that she's worked on in this short period of time. Just, I mean, just put, you know, Moonlight and, and Creed next to each other and go, whoa. And then you throw in Beyonce's Lemonade and you say, there's an emotional art going on there. And that's what the real deal, those people, are really something, and whatever they're communicating, and for whatever reason she can respond, I'm not saying that all of you want to be production designers, but even if you're an architect, you and I've been on the trustee board here, I listen to people talk, and I know about your pedagogy and all the stuff that you you know you study, and you, <laughs> and, you and I think it's great, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm all for it. All I can tell you is you have to get along with some people. <laughs> and so how you do that to get your ideas across and then and interact with them. And I've had conversations with Tom, you know, uh, Wiscom, that, that it's very much about, I'm trying to just convey in an overview whatever you've heard and now talking about all these crazy pictures about the forest and whatever they mean to you, let them mean that to you and then see that, that, that at least what I have to offer here is, is just to say, after 40 years of this, I don't know anything, but I know something about the force. And then, and then I can tell you also that that's what was my key into Awa with Jim in, um, in, in um, Avatar, because I believed in it. 
I, I, I'm a first believer. You've heard that being said by Ann said it, um, uh, Patty Podesta, everybody, you get into this, this role, and if it's your building, if you're an architect, you are a believer. Then the next thing you've got to do, and this is the same for animation, it's the same for acting, it's the same for any pursuit in this medium, which is you first need to believe it yourself, and, and that way other people will find it believable. But the second part is to get people to care. Now, how do you do that? You know, Walt Disney knew that he could get uh, people laughing with uh, Steamboat Willie, you know, but, uh, but he didn't know that he could make them cry. So that's why he created Snow White. And then that's what happened. People could actually give themselves over this abstract medium because they cared. And that would be my, my primary message here through Star Wars or anything, and I'm not answering any of your questions in the right way, but I'm just saying, Let's, let's, you know, if what was said by Anne, you know, if you share any of those points of view, uh, then humanism is under attack. The things that, that we actually care about, spaces that are communal, that you design for real people in their lives, that's, that's, there's a human value to that. Doesn't mean every single thing is gonna be something that, that's just for community, but ultimately, you know, some of these great buildings, whether it's, you know, by many from Frank Gehry, you can feel the humanism. He's designing things not just for the sake of design, but attracting people to come together and have an experience together. So whether it's the medium of production design, cinema, I don't know everybody's point, but it's, a, it's very important to me anyway to be as inclusive in the process as I can and from that, learn something about myself and, and then try to connect that to other people, and that's where the force comes in. I'm sorry not to answer any of your questions. <laughs> that's okay. All right, thanks, Rick. So from Starry Spaceship Skies, um, we head to the mythic landscapes of Azeroth, and we tread the pixel fields and wander the animated planes of the world of Warcraft with Angela Wasco. Um, so in game worlds, Behind the anonymity of our avatars, we see the worst of ourselves sometimes. What does our behavior in these sites say about us? So Angela is an artist, writer, and facilitator devoted to creating new forums for discussion of themes like feminism in the spaces that are mo the most hostile towards it. Um, so Angela has been intervening in a lot of the worlds that we've been talking about tonight. Um, various online game environments and seeding within them such processes, such uh, projects as the Council on Gender Sensitivity and Behavioral Awareness um, uh, that you'll talk a little bit about tonight, um, which is based in, in the world of Warcraft. And uh, behind us, hopefully some of you have been playing uh, the game, The Game, um, which is exploring uh, the very dark world of uh, seduction coaches um, and asking you to to play along um, as a woman in a bar um, being propositioned in various forms. Um, and I was had the pleasure of um, seeing um, Angela do a, a walkthrough of that, that in a festival in Utrecht um, a couple of weeks ago, um, and these be dark lands um, that she's unlocking. Um, so e Angela's going to talk about World of Warcraft uh, and her interventions in that space tonight. Thanks so much, Angela. Wow. Um, thanks so much for having me. This is a, a very unusual context for me. So um, I feel like I'm a bit of a wild card. So hopefully a, a good wild card. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm a research based artist. I make video games, written works, videos, and also a lot of performances often within uh, video games and multi user online spaces. Um, I also teach at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Uh, my most recent project, which you can play back there, uh, I d is a video game that I developed called The Game, The Game. Um, and it's a dating simulator game uh, where you interact with the various practices of different pickup artists. And it is indeed dark. Um, there probably should be a larger warning. <laughs> but um, yeah, hopefully everybody got the content warning in the beginning. But I'm not going to talk about that project today because Liam invited me specifically to discuss interventions inside the virtual environment and massively multiplayer online role playing game world of World Warcraft. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to give a little introduction to this project, and then I'm actually going to do a reenactment of a performance from 2013 for you on your request, <laughs> kicking it, it back. <laughs> um, so I might be a little rusty, but uh, we'll work through it. Um, I haven't had a single thing to do with making World of Warcraft. I want to make that really clear. Um, but I have been critically investigating how users respond to the environment of the game and use it in ways that the developers never anticipated or intended. Um, WoW is a massively multiplayer online role-playing game, which has had a player base of roughly 10 million um, at the height of its popularity. Um, I played World of Warcraft for 10 years. Um, <laughs> for the final four of those years, I created performative interventions inside the game. Um, instead of, you know, killing enemies and getting the badass equipment like I had for many years prior to its founding, as the Council on Gender Sensitivity and Behavioral Awareness in World of Warcraft, I started traveling to highly populated virtual towns, um, like you're seeing here, um, in the game to discuss the ways in which women were treated in the game space with other players. Um, WoW has had a player base that is pretty notorious for being um, quite hostile toward women, people of color, as well as queer and gender nonconforming people. Um, so I sought to figure out why exchanges in this otherwise sweet fantasy looking landscape reflected and reinforced the stereotypical politics of everyday life instead of perhaps liberating us from them as earlier cyber feminists may have hoped for. Um, so from 2012 to 2016, I facilitated public conversations inside the game space, which were often very lengthy, um, sometimes lasting as long as eight hours, and covered topics including why so many uh, men chose to play female avatars. Um, the answer I learned was to project their own fantasy and ownership onto those uh, figures. Um, why many male players think that women are biologically predisposed to be worse at video games than men. Um, how women facing harassment in the space deal with that experience when the developers aren't very supportive. Um, why go back into the kitchen and make me a sandwich became such a common phrase among the player base. Uh, why so many of the diverse players who once played WoW when it started over time left the space. And why feminism was the most polarizing word I could say in the space, uh, among many other much more unexpected topics. Um, the project shifted an in intention from in the beginning, I sort of wanted to try to change the communal language in the space to ultimately realizing how sort of colonial that impulse was and shifting toward trying to create a constant presence and public visibility for the issues of exclusivity that marginalized players face in the space by meeting and talking about it regularly and just sort of taking up space like around this campfire like we're doing here. Um, throughout the four years of the project, the council actually had a, a very appreciated and very active presence on the primary server I was operating on, um, and an inclusive, intentional guild, um, or a, a group, a community of players that does different activities together, um, was created as a result of regularly hosting these conversations, as the community came up with long-term ways for the project to live on without my facilitation, um, which was kind of my goal. Um, all right. <laughs> Before I start doing this reenactment performance for you, I think it'll be helpful to just get used to looking at the game together. But I want to do a poll. How many of you have ever played World of Warcraft? That's so many more than I expected. <laughs> Fantastic. OK, for those of you who haven't played, I'm going to do a very, very brief orientation to understanding the, the interface. I wish my diagrams were as sweet as David's, but they just aren't. Um, <laughs> the, so this is me, <laughs> green circle. Um, today in the reenactment, I'll be playing one of my many characters, uh, but this one is a female orc named Wash Clothes. Um, get it? Uh, <laughs> uh, the yellow circles, these are all actual player characters in this instance hanging out and talking with me. So there's going to be a whole lot of activity going on on the screen, but if you see a little uh, name card on top of somebody's head um, and it's in purple, it's another player character um, with a person behind it, not a non-player character. Um, when a player uses the say command, a speech bubble pops, pops up above their heads and then um, that statement also moves into the chat log. Um, when I do this performance, there's a lot of different ways you can communicate in World of Warcraft. 
Um, but I prefer to use the say command because it's the most visual um, and easiest for audiences to follow. Um, so yeah, you'll see this uh, method of communication primarily throughout the performance. Um, there's a whole lot of other stuff on the interface. Just try not to pay attention to all of that um, and focus on the people and the conversation as I walk us through it. Um, okay, everybody ready? Yes. Look, participation, woo. All right, clapping, I thank you. Woo, feel much less insecure. Okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna walk us through a 2013 performance. So this is really early on in the, the council, and so I'm a worse facilitator than I became later. Um, but in this particular performance, uh, it was one of the first performances where I just started to ask players to discuss what feminism meant to them. Um, I chose this performance for a number of reasons. One, because it moves a little bit more slowly than some of the other ones, so it's a little bit better for a re-performance. And also, it's one of the ones that I get harassed the least. Um, and I didn't want to show you a performance that really reinforces existing stereotypes that you might already be coming to this with about gamers. So um, yeah, that's why I chose this one. It's not maybe the most um, complex conversation, but I think it's one of the easier ones to follow. All right. Here we go. <laughs> oh, you cannot see that. Okay, sorry, one second. Oop. No. Sorry, I'm gonna mirror my display. That that was a lot of anticipation for me to like <laughs> totally <laughs> screw this up. <laughs> Woohoo. Okay. <laughs> and hopefully the sound works. That's a good sign, okay. Um, here we go. <laughs> Hi there, I'm working on a research project. Would anyone mind helping me out? That's me. I'm looking for player definitions of feminism. Ursiva says K. Oh, hi, Ursivus. Do you have a definition of a feminism you wouldn't mind me recording? Um, he says, belief that women should be held equal to men. Not an active feminist, but I do believe women should be equal to men, Ursivus says. Mistis Mu, who you can't see right now, says men and women can't be equal. I say, what makes an active feminist? Mallow says, I think hardcore feminists often think that women are better, lol. Uh, I say, hi, Mistis Mu, why can't men and women be equal? Ursula says, yeah, I think so too, Mallows. I say, do you know a lot of hardcore feminists? Mistis Moo says, that's like saying a dog and cat are exactly the same. And why would you want to be equal to a man? Ursiva says, thank you. Clearly, I'm having a hard time figuring out how to respond to this right now. <laughs> I say, well, they're both male and female cats, and most would say they are still they are still cats despite the gender difference, no? Mallow says, and they change their mind when they don't like something that men has that is desirable. Um, Mrs. Moo says, oh yes, we are all humans, and they are all cats. Misty Smooth says, but the female cat is not the same as the male cat. I just want to add that the average age of the player base of World of Warcraft is 29.5 and not 12. <laughs> I 
Mr. Smoot says equality does get down to the bare bones meaning of sameness. I say, what's the difference between being different and having equality? Then I say, oh, okay. Mrs. Moose says, so you are really saying something different. I say, do you think men and women should have the same opportunities and be equal in that way? Question mark. Mrs. Moose says, you want women to be treated fairly, correct? I say, I'm just the researcher. What I want is not important. Tongue out face. Mrs. Moose says, LOL, yes, all human beings need to be treated with the same opportunities. And I say, so when you say different, you mean biologically? Also, it's Valentine's Day. That's why there's hearts. Mrs. Moose says, we are different in many more ways than bio biologically. I say, can you list some of those other ways? And I jump up and down. Mr. Smoo says, now if you're talking about robots, now there is a great discussion on equality. I say, can you list some of the ways that men are different than women other than biologically? I say, very helpful for my research. Mrs. Moose says, LOL, I would get censored for some, and I doubt you are doing real research. LOL. It's a pair. I say, and hey, Mallows, your female troll looks exactly like mine. Are you female in real life? Mallow says, yes. I say, I am doing real research. I'm interested in why people react to the word feminism the way they do. Um, so please be as crass as you like. I get trolled most of the time anyway. Alvester came in and said, Da fuck? <laughs> Hi, Alvester. Hi, Alvester says. Do you have a definition of feminism you'd like to share by chance? Mallow says, there are things that most women are less equipped to do. Mr. Smooth says, LOL, feminism is another way for communism to be put into society under the pretense of protecting women. Mallow said, they should be allowed the option. I know, it's a lot. Mallow says, but probably not required. I say, can you please explain that a bit, Misty? Misty says, in socialism, all people are required to be treated equal. And I say, Mallows, what types of things are men more equipped to do? Physical things? Mallows says, yes. Alvestor says, stabbing things. Mrs. Moo says, so if you have a person that can lift two pounds, then all people must be equal to that, yes? I ask Alistair, is that your definition of feminism, the whole stabbing things thing? He says yes, and then LOL. I say LOL. Alistair says, I have no idea. I say, Misty, I take it you're not keen on socialism based on the tone of your response. Mallow says, also women go through such things as periods and pregnancy. That should warrant different treatment. Misty says, if one leader decides that all humans should be able to work 18-hour days with X amount of food and, or sorry, pay in food and be able to survive, then that's equality in their eyes. I say, what should having a period warrant in response to Mallow's? Mallow says, it can cause considerable sickness for some women. Mrs. 
racist move says washcloth. Do you think that physical differences and biological things women go through should warrant special treatment? I say, right, so employee, employers should take that into consideration. Is that what you're saying? And that's to Mallow's. Mallow says, yes. Mrs. Moose says, why shouldn't they? It seems like we are all agreeing. I say, if you want my opinion, which is not important for my research, hee hee, I think both women and men that take care for, I think I meant children here, should get time off to take care of new children. Um, Mrs. Moose says, is there a reason employers shouldn't take women's health into consideration? I said, I think the health of both men and women should be considered based on circumstances. Mrs. Moose says, I agree. I say, some women don't have children and don't want to. And then I, and he says, of course, yes. I say, and some men want to spend time with their children after they're born. I think these should both be put into consideration. Mallow says, yes. This is wild. We're all agreeing in World of Warcraft. <laughs> and Smooth says, I agree. And then I say, again, I'm not trying to sway anyone else here. Tongue out face. Mallow says, of course. Sway them to what? Miss V asks. Mallow's answer is, have a different opinion. This is a lot more of my own opinion than normal, but <laughs> I also think that if women are especially sick during a period, it should be considered in the same way that men should be taken seriously when they're ill and not capable of working. Missy says, there doesn't seem to be a clear line really on what you believe in. If you don't agree with feminism? And I say, but feminism can be so personal, I think. Misty says, oh yes, for sure. And yes, many respect for their health, of course. How civil. I say, why do you think feminism has so many negative connotations? Mello says, the period thing would cause women to need more sick days. Considering it's a monthly sort of deal. Overall, fairness and opportunities need to be made, and feminism is giving that a bad rap, says Miss Dismoo. The owl looking thing. <laughs> I say in the same way that someone who has a recurring illness not related to gender or reproductive health would need that taken into consideration regularly, though. How does feminism, in quotes, give that a bad rap? Demonic enters the conversation and says, I used to hire people. I also have an opinion on this matter. <laughs> Mello says, I suppose yes. I say, hi, Demonic. I would love to hear it. He says, I wouldn't hire women for the type of work we did. I say, what type of work is this? Someone else says, and what type is that? Mallows. Demonic says, completely biased on physical attributes, HVAC. <laughs> Heating, venting, and air conditioning. Frizzle says, LOL. Mr. Smoo says, I agree on that one. I say, did women ever apply? Demonic says, yes. All the time. More than you'd imagine. And I say, and you immediately dismiss them. Serena says, can I apply, get turned down for being a woman, and then sue you? <laughs> Demonic says, never in an obvious manner. <laughs> We're so close. Demonic says, well, here's the thing. In my line of work, you need to be well built in the upper body. I say, but deep down, you never intend on hiring a female for that job. Mr. Smooth says, that could be a totally new conversation, LOL. Serena says, I'm serious. I could use some moolah right now. I ask, was there any type of physical test for the job? 
Demonic says, and I can't be bothered with a period issue. I say, LOL, Serena. Mr. Smooth says, LOL. Demonic says, the physical test was, if you survive the first month, we put you on full time. I say, not every female has a period issue. Mrs. Moo says, okay, I'm off to a dungeon now. Have fun, smiley face. Serena says, yeah, when we get our periods, we aren't even people anymore. It's totally an issue. I say, have you ever offered a woman the first month? The monarch says, right, but I can't outright ask, hey, lady, do you get lame on your period? <laughs> I ask Serena if she's serious. Serena says, I'm serious that I want to be turned down for being a woman and sue his sexist ass. I say, everyone has days when they're off. Periods, no periods, heavy periods, light periods. Demonic says, whoa, 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 I love women. <laughs> so Saldina so says, LOL, what the fuck? I say, I don't think, or sorry, I don't say that. Demonic says, I don't think that what I do is necessarily fair. Mallow's asked, do you offer the first month of women? Serena says, but you don't respect them. Demonic says, but I do believe it's just. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much, Angela. That was fantastic. Um, so from the digital landscapes of World of Warcraft, um, we head to the underworld where we visit the fantasy landscapes of Hellboy and the Bureau of the Paranormal Research and Defense. Mike Mignola is a comic artist and writer known for creating the Mignolaverse, as Wikipedia tells me, um, with Dark Horse Comics. He's um, generated a collection of titles including Hellboy and the BPRD. Uh, he's also created similarly themed titles including Baltimore, The Amazing Screw on Head, Joe Gollum, The Occult Detective. Um, and tonight, uh, Mike is going to be joined in conversation by Jeff Mano, um, the creator of Building Blog, um, which I'm sure so many people in this building all follow. Um, Jeff has also uh, recently released um, A Burglar's Guide to the City, um, which is an extraordinary um, uh, exploration of the alternative uses and in occupations of architecture. Um, but the reason Jeff and Mike are together tonight is that um, what you should track down on Building Blog is an extraordinary interview that Jeff uh, did with Mike a few years ago. And um, having recently moved back to the city, um, uh, we thought it would be amazing to, to continue that conversation in some form. So please all read um, the first part of that uh, discussion and tonight um, it's kind of interview redux um, and we just thought it'd be fun to, to get the two of them back together again um, to continue the conversation. <laughs> Plus I was afraid form. to do it by myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thanks so much both of you for joining us. Um, sure. Thanks Jeff. Yeah, thanks Liam for having us. Um, well, yeah, I wanted to jump right in uh, with the theme of the evening, which is world building. Um, Mike, there's so much that we could talk about in, in your work, um, but what I wanted to start with was uh, pretty big and abstract, as you know, which is uh, the notion of tone and atmosphere. Um, there's something really, you, know, you, you tend to know you're reading a Mike Mignola comic when uh, you know, there are lots of characters emerging out of a very inky black darkness, very isolated or uh, moving towards a, a lone object in the distance, or there's a castle in the background. Um, but I was curious if we could focus on um, Hellboy in Hell, which is uh, kind of the, the outgoing uh, masterwork of the Hellboy universe, um, and talk about uh, how tone and atmosphere are created, um, the, uh, what you know about the world before you go into illustrating it, um, and even things like the, just the composition on the page. You know, is, that, is it just a byproduct of having isolated characters surrounded by blackness that gives it that kind of hellish atmosphere? I don't know. Um, okay. I don't know why I do what I do. Uh, I've just been doing it a really long time. Um, the one thing I want to say about world building up front is, um, unlike somebody who's doing it, like say for a film, um, I kind of hoped I would be doing it for a long time. So I've had 25 years to build this world. So that's kind of nice. And um, my goal was not to embarrass myself. So I wrote things very vague. Uh, so I wouldn't write myself into a corner. Um, 
and yeah, for 25 years, with, with some other people helping me out, I've, I've built this world. Um, and d discovered the world as I went. Very much like what you were saying about Star Wars, you know, you're, you're, you're coming up with stuff, and you don't quite know who these characters actually are, but you can write some vague prophecies, uh, and then keep in the back of your mind that someday you've got to figure out what the hell that means. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's what I did for a long time. Eventually, I figured out a lot of stuff. The trick is to have all that um, material figured out, but not necessarily put it all on the page. You know, it's nice that the reader knows there's something going on, but you're know, feeding them bits and pieces because you don't want to suddenly just dump a big history lesson on them uh, or a big, you know, here's the big map of how everything's connected. So I know that stuff, or I figured it out, figure it out just ahead of the reader. Uh, and eventually, you know, Hellboy took place in the real world, more or less, my version of the real world. Very few cars, and only drawing cars. Um, but eventually I killed him off and sent him to hell, which is just made of all the stuff I'd figured out over the years that I wanted to draw. Because I'm very, very lazy, and I just want to draw what I want. Uh, and people have been reading the book for a really long time, and I figured I'm not going to lose this audience. Great, I'll let them, I'll take them with me to a place where I just get to draw old buildings. Um, and that doesn't answer, I believe, any of your questions, uh, <laughs> which seems to be a theme. Um, what was the question? Uh, I guess I'm curious when you, when it even comes to designing and drawing old buildings. I guess I'm just interested in, in uh, the the composition, color, shape. Uh, do you find that atmosphere comes from just putting things in the middle of the page and leaving the rest black, which has no, the kind of you know Lovecraftian? There, well, there's no there's no simple answer for that. It, sure. it entirely depends on you know what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know as a as a cartoonist, you're in control of everything. Uh, I write the the work myself, the Hellbent Hell stuff's all written by me. So I, you know, there's there's happy scenes, there's open scenes, there's scenes where a character is small in a big open panel, which gives a certain kind of atmosphere. Um, there's scenes where a figure is half emerging from shadows, like you mentioned in the question, uh, which is a different kind of atmosphere. There's uh, different arrangements of panels to manipulate time, um, you know, Again, I, I, I drew comics for 10 years before I did the Hellboy stuff. So I figured out how to you know, work this language. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really difficult answer. You know, it, it, it's really difficult, actually impossible, for me to give a real simple answer to how do you do these certain things. You, you, know, you, you create a language. And at, at this point, finally, in my advanced years, I feel like I know how to use these tools. Um, so, it, so ask me something else so I can sure. stop wandering. Well, it's interesting then that also you're, you've come to basically the end of the Hellboy arc or it's being sort of put to bed right now. And, um, yeah, that's an intense focus on character. There's the notion of Hellboy. Um, you know, even uh, when we spoke several years ago, um, we, mo we were, um, on the subject of character, you were talking about. You know, there were there were worlds that you wanted to draw or think about or spend time in, but you didn't have the right character to, to go into them yet. So you wanted to do a World War One battlefield, but putting Hellboy there didn't make any sense because you didn't have the right character. But now, what's really interesting, I think about, especially in Hellboy um, in Hell, is it almost as if the world now is becoming more important than the characters, and you're just sort of invested in this, uh, you know, the all of the things that you've always wanted to draw in your imagination, the old buildings, etc. Could you talk about the idea of a world without characters? Yeah, I mean. Um yeah, that's that kind of happened by accident. Um, I I took a break from Hellboy years ago and did a um, a comic that was just supposed to be weird shit that nobody was going to like except for me, mm -hmm. uh, because Hellboy had become commercial enough. We had you know a couple movies and stuff. I just thought I'm a Berkeley art student. It's very important for me to do a book that. Uh, Berkeley art students would recognize as a book that clearly wasn't going to make money. You know, he could just be cranking out another Hellway book, but he's done the amazing screw on head. Nobody in the right mind wants that book. He, he's the only person who thinks it's funny. He's got a publisher who will do whatever he says. Uh, he'll do it for no money, so the publisher won't 
hold it over his head forever that they lost money on it. So anyway, I did this book, The Amazing Screw on Head. And of course, right away, everybody said, oh, it's the best thing you've ever done. And it won awards and, you know, all TV option and all kind of nonsense you never expected. But it's still just a a, a weird piece of nonsense I did entirely for myself. And uh, I created this sort of world. It's not really a world. It doesn't make any sense. It's just it was the first time I drew something that was entirely made out of shit I liked, just weird old machines and, and Victorian people with floating skull heads, and it was just my shit. Uh, and I got away with it. So you go back to drawing hell, but it takes place on Earth, and everyone so there's got to be a car and all this other shit that you don't want to draw. But I'd already created this world where I got away with murder, making up all my own shit. So eventually, it was like, hey, if I kill Hellboy and send him to hell, and hell is just that place that's made of old rowboats and buildings leaning into each other, and there's never going to be a car, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Um, so that's where I put him. And he was supposed to be there forever and run around and have all kinds of adventures. And what I discovered, and I'm actually getting to, I think, your question, um, what I discovered is... I, I loved the world, and Hellboy would walk down the street in the world, and while he's going that way, I'm kind of going, yeah, but what's going on over here? And, ooh, I just really want to draw this building. But yeah, we got to tell the story, we got to follow Hellboy over here, but I really just kind of want to draw these buildings. So eventually you go, I'm kind of done with Hellboy. I'd like to keep him around because he pays the bills real well, but mostly I, as the artist, want to just draw those buildings and go inside those buildings and draw the people that are inside those buildings. So I've gotten to this place because I'm very, very fortunate um, where Hellboy can kind of do whatever he's going to do or not do anything at all because, thank God, they're making another movie. Um, and I'm going to just draw the buildings and the houses and the people that are in those things and see you know, how long I can do that without doing story. So over this 25 years of doing Hellboy, I ended up creating my world. And thank you, Hellboy, for getting me there. But now I just want to draw that world. It's like an endless tracking shot through hell. Exactly. And I, I, I mean, I imagine doing comics where it's just roaming down those streets or panning into a window and around a corner. Uh, yeah, there's some commercial shit. Uh, but, you know, I've got a publisher who, that wants to keep me happy, and I'm sure they'll publish it or somebody will publish it. And, you know, thank God, because I'm making a movie, I can afford to do it without an advance. Nice. So, yeah, that always helps. Uh, so, yeah, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty old now, and Hellboy, there's a lot of Hellboy books in print. Um, and so hopefully, theoretically, I can afford to just do some hopefully interesting shit, um, which a lot of us you know, artists don't get to do. You know, um, the Hellboy world continues written and drawn. I mean, I kind of co-write some of it, but it's written and drawn by other, a, a lot of it's drawn, written and drawn by other people. So I've created this machine that's sort of paying the bills, and there's a lot of books in print. Theoretically, those keep selling, hopefully. Um, so I get to keep just exploring what I want to do as an artist. And, and I did it with Hellboy eventually, when, with the Hellboy and Hell stuff and then the amazing Screw on Head stuff. I've created a body of work that only I could do, and it's not with any client. Because I've worked on films. I've worked on stuff where you're working for a client, and it's interesting. And collaborating is really interesting. But really, there's nothing like just sitting there and making up your own thing. And it's kind of overwhelming, um, but, but uh, it's, it's, it's cool. So there's work out there that nobody else could do because nobody else has got my same sensibilities. So you know, it's a great thing to give to your therapist because you go, look, for 25 years, they left me alone to do this. I don't know what it says about me. I don't really want to know. But you can write a book about it if you want. <laughs> yeah, I love the uh, emerging sub-theme uh, of uh, collaborative art practice as uh, emotional therapy that's coming out of this, uh, the, the panel here. Um, I guess I'm curious, too, just in, in terms of those worlds. I mean, you've got such um, interesting uh, character and world overlaps. Like, you've got um, Lobster Johnson in, you know, noirish what, 1930s New York City. 
um, Edward Grey, Witchfinder in, um, I guess, Edwardian, Victorian London. Um, you've got things set in uh, with Baltimore and World War One battlefields, et cetera, et cetera. I guess I'm just curious if there is a either a character who you still have, insofar as you would want to talk about this in public, if there's a character that you're really um, incite, excited to work on, but it doesn't have a world yet, or if there's a world that you like the hell of Hellboy in Hell, um, that is something you spend a lot of time in imaginatively, you draw, et cetera, but you just haven't found the right character or the right narrative to, to um, in, in fully invest. I, you know, I think I've always created story before characters. Uh, I, I mean, I did a Batman comic that I wrote or plotted. And it was a straight up supernatural story because that's the kind of shit I like and that's the stuff I read. Uh, so I, I did a supernatural Batman story and I got away with it and people liked it. And I thought, this is cool. I could make up more stories where I get to draw what I want, graveyard, I could draw the Batmobile, I had to, it's horrible. Uh, but you know, draw graveyard and, and, and shit like that. So yeah, I did this Batman story like that I've completely forgotten the question now. Um, and then I thought, well, if I got away with that, I'll keep it, make up my own stories so I get to draw what I want. But while I'm at it, why don't I just make up my own guy? And a regular guy is going to be boring. But if I make the regular guy, the hero, a monster, then I'm drawing monsters all the time. Even if it's at the grocery store, I'm still drawing monsters. All I ever wanted to do was draw monsters in old buildings. So I'll. <laughs> make up a monster who fights ghosts and vampires and shit in old buildings. Um, so I knew the kind of stories I wanted to do, and then it was just coming up with a character that would be fun to draw. And then, and I had no idea who the fuck he was. You know, the, in the first comic, there's a sequence where he arrives on Earth, and I just thought it was funny that a guy who looks like the devil, he's got a tail and hooves, uh, everybody goes, hey, look, he's the good guy's here. And I just thought that was funny. And it it wasn't until a year, a couple years later, that I realized, oh, maybe he's the Beast of the Apocalypse, because I had somebody started yakking in the comic. It's weird when you write this stuff, and the characters start saying shit, and you go, well, all right, I didn't have anything else for you to say, so if you want to talk to Hellboy about being the Beast of the Apocalypse, I guess he's the Beast of the Apocalypse. Sure. Uh, so that was weird when that happened. Um, but that's how that shit happened. So I didn't, I didn't sit there and go, I really want to do a comic about the Beast of the Apocalypse. I just said, I just want to draw a guy who, you know, doesn't drive a car and fights mm. monsters. Yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds like that's part of that incremental uh, construction of worlds over time, as opposed to, you know, you show up and you've got the kind of map in the beginning of Lord of the Rings that shows you, you know, where all the kingdoms are. Like, you have no idea where, where the story's going to go or, you know, where BPRD is going to end up. Yeah, or... I, I mean, I, I, I don't know, that, did Tolkien really sit down and figure all that stuff out and then say, and then I'm going to make up a story? Because I know for me, you're making up a story and little bits of information pop up. You, you'll come up with some bit, and then that while 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 you're while you're working on the story, and you've come up with some little bit, there's that other part of your brain that says, "Hey, that was a cool bit. You know what that relates to?" And this part of your brain is making up all that other shit, and you're going, "Yeah, yeah, that's great. Write that shit down over there. I'll use it later. But right now, I'm doing this thing." So. So you come up with things, and same you come up with a character that's a throwaway character, and sometimes the throwaway character just goes away. You use them once, you're done. And then other characters will go, no, no, I've got 6,000 other stories about me over here, and I want you to do them all. And you go, uh, all right, put, go over there, and maybe we'll get back to that. Hmm. So that's how that shit happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the other thing I like about your work so much is... Um, how you set up an entire world just through some tiny little detail in the background or some tiny little detail on a character. So, you know, you tend to know you're reading a Mignola when there's a giant gorilla standing in the back of the room, but it's got bolts on the side of its head. Uh, or, you know, there's a flaming castle in the background in an alpine scene. Um, or there's a, an old, uh, you know, uh, abandoned temple or church, but then you notice that there are tentacles sliding across the floor. Um, you know, a good, a, another example is um, the, uh, the little girl um, who uh, confronts, I guess it's a priest, but then, you know, she reveals that she has a wolf's head. Um, I just think that those little details, you know, that's uh, even, um, you know, a, as a lesson a wolf for... Head. A little girl with a wolf head is not a little detail. It's not sure. meant to go unnoticed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a statement. Yeah. Um, but it's those kind of unexpected uh, detailed juxtapositions that I think is that creates an entire world, and it, and it punches way above its weight, and it, and it has this entire imaginative uh, uh, atmosphere to it. Well, I mean, again, as a guy who has to draw the thing, um, I, 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 
there's very little I draw that serves no purpose because I I know what the story is. It's different when you're when you're drawing somebody else's story. And I spent ten years drawing other people's stories. And you go, man, I couldn't give a shit about this story, but it's got a hedgehog in it, and I really want to draw a hedgehog. So I'm going to make the hedgehog the star of the, the star of this thing visually. Um, the writer's probably not going to be thrilled about that because he didn't give a shit about the hedgehog. You just added the hedgehog. Um, but for me, since I know the story, I'm 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 focusing on the things that are important to the story, um, and and a lot of stuff that isn't important is is barely visible in shadows or it's just left left out. So, um, yeah. So you know, if, if the if the the punchline is you know you turn the page and suddenly this girl has a wolf's head, that means it's a black background with a little girl with a wolf head. It's not like you know some of these comics I see they're drawn by very talented guys, but there's so much shit going on that you go, wow, there's so many lines. Hey, wait, I just noticed the girl has a wolf head. No, in my stuff, it's a big chunk of black and a wolf head and a little girl body making a statement that says something like, why did God do this to me? And you go, oh, that's a pretty blunt tool. I'm a blunt tool. <laughs> In terms of that, I mean, the other thing that I think is so uh, exciting about the worlds that you've drawn and written um, is that there really is a, that that type of uh, you, you you can get away with um, I guess I'd say very large kind of theological or philosophical statements, but it's precisely because they're in this kind of absurdist, uh, almost like 1950s universe where Hellboy walks around cracking jokes, and yet at the same time there's an almost uh, like sad existentialism to the entire character of Hellboy. I guess I'm just kind of curious about where that aspect of your work comes from. Does it come out of the absurdity of what you're drawing, or is there sort of like a, a serious Mignola somewhere trying to trying to sneak out? There, there, there is the serious guy who's at war with the other guy who's writing the comic. Um, there's the serious guy who really wants it to sound like Shakespeare. So when he writes the bad guy, you know, it gets very lofty, and then the the other part of me gets very embarrassed by the part that's writing the lofty, serious stuff. And then that's why Hellboy says things like, you know, that's big talk for a guy with no pants. Or, you know, Jesus, you're literally boring me to death because there's two parts of my brain. There's a part that says, I want to write this big speech. And then there's a the part that's so fucking embarrassed that you're writing this giant speech <laughs> that you have to let the audience know, I didn't write that part. That was the other guy. I'm, I'm Hellboy. I'm the guy who says, no, you're fucking killing me because it's so boring. Um, so that's how that works. And also, I mean, I've, I'm, I've gotten old. You know, I, I, I'm not the guy I was when I started drawing an adventure comic in 1993. Um... And I've been living with these characters for a really long time. And it's not Batman or Superman. It's not a character that's meant to stay the same forever because it's that kind of a thing. It's really where the whole idea in this particular world, in, in the Hellboy world, is that we're dealing with the end of the world. So we're eventually killing and destroying, or at least changing, evolving, everything, including the main character. So that's what I've gotten to do for 25 years. Because I own this world, I get to end it. Uh, I get to do the, the full arc of all these characters. So, um, yeah, that, that's that. <laughs> cool. Oh. It sounds like a good note to end with the exact time there. So you said the end at the yeah. exact time the red flashing Excellent. light started. I didn't even notice that. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, guys. That was cool. great. Thanks, thanks. Mike. Thank you. All right. So we've come. We're coming to the end of our expedition, and finally we pull up to the launch pad. <laughs> So we've explored all the edges of the Earth, and now we board the rockets, ready to depart for solar systems beyond. Uh, so for the last stop this evening, we tour the exoplanets, sites we can only ever inhabit through the interstellar vehicles of fiction, or in this case, the poster art of David Delgado, NASA, and JPL. They're sites that are very distant, but force us to put ourselves in context and force us to see just how small we really are. So we're joined 
by David Delgado for The Last Stop, um, who's a visual strategist with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he creates experiences to bring audiences closer to emerging technologies and prompts them to emotionally engage with contemporary scientific research. Um, David's going to talk through a series of worlds um, uh, explored through a collection of posters, I yeah. think, right? Thanks, David. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I'm David. Nice to be here. Um, I just wanted to start out, I love this quote, I found it somewhere at Eden Philpotts, uh, but the universe is filled with magical things, patiently waiting for our wits to grow sharper. I really love that because there's so many things layered in that, is that it, there is this continuous um, hope that something better will happen in the future. And the, this, uh, this inability to grasp it now is like this continuous drive forward that we seem to all have. I was listening to this radio show and somebody was talking about um, this, if you could imagine a, a sort of a, a spectrum um, from despair to hope and, um, you know, where would humans fall on that? And, you know, I think that human, and they were saying on the, on the radio show that humans fall at, at like 51% towards hope. You know, and it's just that one percent that like keeps us, you know, moving forward. If we were if we were just a little bit back, it would have just all be over. Everybody would just give up, you know. And um, that's kind of one of the things that I like about this quote is that um, is that 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 there's the assumption that these things are there. And one of the things that's interesting when you talk about space and space exploration is that it is the the assumption that these things are there. And we uh, are just, just slowly unfolding our understanding of sort of where we are in the universe. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that through exoplanets. But first, I want to just show you, uh, this is a Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, it's a federally funded research institution for NASA. Um, it's a place where people build rovers that go to Mars. Um, look out into the galaxy to try to understand what is out there and um, really study the Earth to try to figure out what it is that we're living on. And um, it's also kind of a funny place where you see stuff like this, right? Where it's just a lab where, you know, in case of fire, don't use water, right? You look at that and you're like, okay, well, what's going on there? Or, uh, or this is great, I love this one. You walk down and there's a wall and there's just a little keyhole that says laser bypass. You know, it's funny because in this photo, it looks like it's next to a door. This is not next to a door. It's like in the middle of the wall. So you, you look at that and you're like, where's the laser? You know, <laughs> and what's it bypassing? <laughs> you know, and um, of course you see things like this. Uh, the, there's a, uh, the replica or the, the test model of the exact replica of the one that's on Mars. Um, and so you have a lot of that kind of thing there. But my favorite thing that you see is this. You see, <laughs> the discussion of classified information in restrooms is prohibited. So it's kind of a funny place. It's like a, a mix of, um, I don't know, 1950s buildings with um, a bunch of people like this who are gathering together and really trying to figure out how to do big things. Um, like, like land on other planets and really just try to hash their way through it and figure it out. And, um, you know, we're, we're a group of designers um, and artists. Uh, we call ourselves a studio. Um, there's about eight of us. And, the, you know, we, we do things like this um, that really try to get people to think about things that you can't see. Um, uh, or things that um, NASA is interested in seeing. Uh, on the left-hand side, or the, I guess up here, um, this is a dome that uh, is filled with speakers. It's an ambisonic sound system. And we've given 19 Earth science satellites that are going around the globe their own sound so that when you walk in, um, they'll speak to you when they fly overhead. And we've made a, a direct relationship to exactly where they are in the sky. Um, and where that sound comes from the speaker. So as they pass over, you can, you can point your finger up and that is, we worked hard on this. That's, that's where it would be. And we, we tested it when the International Space Station flew over um, to things like getting people to, uh, you know, uh, creating experiences to uh, get people to think about comets. Um, this is one that 
on, on the other side where we create an experience to um, get people to imagine what it would be like to be inside a tail of a comet. Um, and uh, we do things like just to get the speaking to the choir at JPL, you know, get them to be excited about their work. So you have an earth bumper sticker, travel sticker. Uh, we help, uh, you know, scientists and engineers help them think through their thinking about the way that they develop missions and, um, and then also just create things to talk about exploration. And, and the poster is, uh, is really what I'm going to focus on today. It was a whole series of them. Um, and uh, if you walk into JPL, you, you'll see this, this thing, and it's a planet counter. And just to, just to get a sense of uh, everybody out there, does it have, has anybody heard of exoplanets, or do you guys know what exoplanets are? Okay, cool. That's great. Um, so um, exoplanets, for those of you who don't know, are planets you know, around other stars. So we have our solar system, and we're all you know, circling around our star, which is the sun. Uh, but as uh, the scientists and engineers are looking out into the sky, um, they've developed ways to notice that there are other planets around there too. And mostly, most of the time that way is literally just staring at the star, right, with the telescope, and then waiting for a planet to cross right in front of that direct line of sight so that um, you'll see a little dip in the light, right? just a little dip, and that's been a very successful method. There are other methods, but just with that method alone, um, scientists have discovered thousands and thousands of other planets around other stars. And um, this planet counter we have here is, is uh, separates them into three categories. And so you have the candidates, the confirmed, and this is sort of the golden, the section at the top of uh, planets that are in the habitable zone. And so uh, just real quickly, if, if you're a candidate, that means you've been seen by one mission. Uh, confirmed, that means two missions have seen you. It means you're really there. And then habitable zone is, they call it the Goldilocks zone also. It's this, this place uh, that's not too far from or not too close to the sun, so it's not too hot, not too cold, they're Goldilocks. Uh, but that's where scientists think there could be uh, liquid water on the surface, and the whole goal is to find places where life could emerge. And this is just a huge, huge focus there. Um, just to give a sense of scale of, of what we're talking about, my friend uh, uh, Dan Goods, who I work with, um, created this piece, and I really love it. It's a grain of sand. So this is looking at a grain of sand in a microscope, and um, it, it's kind of funny. I guess you could do this at JPL. He took it down to the machine shop and asked them to, dr to drill a little hole in that grain of sand, wow. and they did. <laughs> and so that's actually a, a tiny little hole in a tiny little grain of sand. But if you um, think about it, this is a metaphor, is that, is that, uh, or an analogy really, is that if that grain of sand represented our galaxy, all of our galaxy, the Milky Way, um, it's within that little hole that we live and it's within that little hole that all of those planets that I was talking about before and, and more now have been discovered. And to represent the rest of the entire universe, you would need 60 rooms, 10 by 10 cubes, filled with sand. And it's amazing to think that. It's like, there's so much out there. And you know, here we are, we think we're big, we're doing great things, we're landing on Mars, and it's, we haven't even come close to anything near what is out there. And so um, to me, that's kind of exciting and inspiring, um, but it's, it's just not, it's just not even close. So we started to play this game uh, when uh, the Exoplanet Exploration Office is at JPL, and they asked us to think of some ideas to, um, to help talk about exoplanets, and uh, we started playing this game. So you guys wanna play it? Yeah. All right, okay, so here it is. Is this an exoplanet? No, no, it's a hamburger bun. <laughs> what about this? Is it an exoplanet? No, you're right, it's a potato. <laughs> I think you're starting to catch up. Is this an exoplanet? Avocado. An avocado. <laughs> So um, we were kind of cracking up because at first we were like taking photos of things and trying to find interesting ways to visualize something that could have like really, um, you know, just features of, of strange places and things like that. And, uh, but really the fact is that it's really hard to, nobody knows what different exoplanets look like. We don't have any direct visuals of um, exoplanet surfaces to this detail at all. And, um, 
And that's an interesting thing. So it's great because creatively, that means you can kind of get away with a lot, right? Um, but uh, it's also interesting that, that all of the data and all of those thousands of planets that we've discovered are literally just dips on a, on a light chart, you know? And so this idea of knowing that they're there, but not knowing what they look like, but knowing that they're there kind of started to get us to ask the question of, well, what, what would it look like and, and what um, could it be like? And specifically, what would it be like if we went there? And so um, that's what sort of led to this series of, of posters um, that we created. It was really travel posters. We were inspired by travel posters from the 20s and 30s. Um, really love those a lot because those sort of responded to that general question of what it would be like to go there, you know. And one of the things we really loved about those also was that they showed the place. And it's one of the, those beautiful mediums where uh, it, uh, beautifully rendered uh, illustrations, but there's also like a, a real honesty to them as they just show you where you're going to go. And so we thought that that really worked well. Um, and so we were thinking through, um, well, what planet should we do? And, and so we got together with a bunch of uh, scientists there, and they would, they were telling us this planet, this planet. And so I'm going to go through the, a few of those just to show you. But uh, one of them really kind of caught our attention at first, and they're called rogue planets. And just to give you a sense of how strange things can be, um, there are these things called rogue planets, which uh, scientists aren't sure how they uh, have developed, really, but they're planets that have either been um, thrown out of a solar system by some crazy gravitational weirdness, um, or or there's there's something else. And so, but the, regardless, they're they're floating alone in space with no star. So, just imagine that. And um, they gave us a challenge, and they said, "Well, you know, you can't do that. It's going to be too dark. It's going to be too." You know, what are you going to do? And so, no, 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 we, we thought, yeah, no, it's great because it's where the nightlife never ends, right? <laughs> and so they, we wanted to take on kind of a, like a, a, a tongue-in-cheek approach to this whole thing, um, not only really to kind of capture the, the sort of the flair of some of those old posters, which, you know, have like funny little cheesy taglines, but it makes something like, you know, the names of these planets are so weird. Uh, PSOJ 318.5-22, where the nightlife never ends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, so this sort of really kind of uh, started something that we thought would be fun and special, and, and it led to these, um, these different posters, which we're all responding to. Um, we, we only wanted to show one thing about each place. And, you know, when you talk to the scientists, they, for sure, they'll tell you a million things about everything that they've learned, and it's great. And, um, but we were thinking, well, if somebody could come and look at this, what's the one most interesting characteristic of each place? And so, um, you know, you have Kepler-16b, um, something that we've all are super familiar with from Star Wars. Right, it's a it's a place with two suns, and so we're like, well, what's what's cool about that? And of course, we had to throw in the tagline, right, where your shadow always has company, or there's <laughs> <laughs> there's places uh, where um, <clears throat> the plants would evolve to reflect a, a different kind of light, right? So different kind of star, and the plant life would be much different. So rather than plants um, reflecting the green light. Um, they would reflect, reflect red, and, and those places are really there. Um, HD 40307G, Super Earths, more massive. You know, how could you have fun with more something that's more massive, more gravity? And so we're just always putting it through that lens of if we were to go there, what would humans do? How would people have fun doing it? And um, but at the same time, try to be true to. Uh, what the science is saying about that place. And so we spent a lot of time working with the scientists, uh, just brainstorming and talking through what they, what they have learned um, through the research. Um, funny thing is, though, it's, it's, we started to know we were onto something where people would write us up. There was this, uh, this group in Russia. They wrote us up and they said, hey, would you mind if we translated these into Russian? And then we had a group from India that did that, and then a group from Brazil. And we said, yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, but this was catching people's attention, and we didn't really fully understand why. And then it, and then it went crazy, right? People, 
loved these things. And this really caught us off guard because uh, the funny kind of irony of the whole thing is that um, we made uh, these three posters to start out with. Um, our, the original request for us was, can you decorate a hallway? Because a scientist, a very important scientist, Sarah Seeger, is going to come. And she is a famous exoplanet scientist. We want to show that we're thinking about this. And, you know. and so when this happened, we were like, what? This is crazy. But it was kind of funny because it made us realize that, um, that this idea of this hope for the future is, is very, very powerful. And all of the storytelling that has ha happened up to today that sort of imagines all of these worlds has created this very um, uh, powerful and, and like responsive place in people's um, hearts, I guess. Um, but it caught their attention. Um, also, kind of funny, weird thing is that when you do things for NASA, it belongs to the public. So there's a whole industry of people who just take the art immediately and sell it, right? So if any of you guys are looking for a retro NASA travel poster flask, there you go. <laughs> And uh, you know you can buy ties, um, guitar picks, wrapping paper. It's kind of funny. The only thing we this is we always laugh at this stuff, so we always look online to see what's the new thing that's out there. Um, and we were just kind of bummed that they were so cheap. We we're gonna call them up and be like, "Don't you want to sell them for more? <laughs> Come on!" Um, but I, I just wanted to kind of walk you through um, what it sort of the the process of working with scientists and and um, creating a, a travel poster. And uh, this one happened a little bit later. It kind of came full circle because the scientist, Sarah Seeger, that we were originally creating the posters for to decorate the hallway, um, it ended up coming up to our office and um, telling us about this uh, big discovery called TRAPPIST-1. Now, TRAPPIST-1 is a, it's a system it's really different than ours in that it's a, it's a very small red star, and um, it has seven planets that are going around it very, very quickly. And so these planets have these really uh, strange characteristics. And so uh, we're asking uh, her and a few other scientists what that, you know, what, what is it? And so they go, oh, yeah, so, oh, so just so you know, so TRAPPIST-1 is the star, right? Um, all of the planets in, in, in that system, they start with, they, the next one out is B, C, D, E, F, G, H. You never have an A. That's the star. Um, but they'd be like, oh, yeah, it's an eyeball planet. I'm like, wow, eyeball planet, what's that? You know? Oh, and the other one's a, it's sort of more of like a water world, ice, um, and one is a mini Neptune and snowball planet. Well, they've developed really all of these different um, sort of coined terms for the different categories of planets. Um, eyeball planets being one that is tidally locked, it doesn't spin on an axis. So you have one that's facing the star all the time, it just gets really hot. So you have one hot side and when you, I guess, look at them, perhaps it resembles an eyeball, right? And you have a like, hot center. Um, but the challenge with this was that we wanted to do a poster that represented the whole system rather than uh, just one characteristic of one planet. And what makes this place really unique is that it's 40 light years away. It's close enough to study optically. So uh, when another telescope goes up, they'll be able to do that. Um, but these are planets that are Earth-like planets that have water on them, potentially, and atmospheres and clouds. And so for the, in the, the, just the general process of really kind of looking at places where other life could exist, um, this is a really, really, really special one. And so the scientists were just all over it. And, um, and, but to try to make sense of how to show this, what we were just trying to think of like, well, how do you show, how do you show a system, right, if it's gonna be one picture? And so just trying to, we tried to map out visually where, where things could be, what would be the best planet to be on to see all of the rest. And so um, I just created this little, this little diagram to think, well, if you're on E, and you're looking sort of that way, you might in, in the sky see all the rest. Like three would be closer and three would be farther, farther away. And um, I showed this to the scientists and they were like, oh yeah, that, that's great. And so even though this is a rudimentary sketch and it doesn't really correspond to like the real distances, it came pretty close. And so 
started just to think of like how to do that, you know? And so we were like, well, if, if E is a water world, uh, potentially maybe there's like an ocean and, and maybe if we're, you know, it's all about all these worlds, maybe it's about like, you know, hopping from one planet to the next. And so maybe that's the concept for this poster. It's like planet hopping, right? But the real sweet spot is this, uh, the, the glory shot is all of these planets in the sky. Um, but they would all have to be crescent, crescent moons because, or crescent planets with a light from one side. And so we thought, oh, okay, that's, that's interesting. And the scientists agreed to that. And, and then, um, so uh, most of these uh, posters, by the way, were illustrated by Joby Harris in our office. And he's just amazing. And one of the things, he just loves just going at it. And so um, once we got to the stage, he, he just went for it. And um, the scientists were working really closely with him. And, um, you know, they just wanted to spend a lot of time tweaking exactly how the light kind of hit each one. And um, it's, uh, it was kind of an interesting example of, of that collaboration. And, and I don't know. Uh, I think as the, the poster series went on, um, one of the really nice things was that the scientists became more and more interested in being a part of it. Um, and one of the things that I really loved too was that during this process, um, we were looking at you know how these planets that are going around, and we're thinking about well, you know what could the poster be about? Um, and they're very close. You'd see them huge in the sky. And wouldn't that affect tides? We started uh, asking ourselves, like, well, we know the moon affects tides here. And so we, we're just asking a lot of questions all the time. And the scientists were like, no, 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 no. But then he went back, and then he sent back this email. And this is great, because it was like, I feel like I've contributed to the science, right? <laughs> He's like, you're totally right about the tides. You know? Um, so you can surf on these planets. And um, it's kind of funny because just in that interaction, and it, it's, it's, I'm kind of joking about, well, I do feel proud about it, but the, just through conversation, they're going through the same process that we're going through. They're asking questions. They're trying to figure things out. They're trying to understand what this place is about. They're making their best guesses based on what the science says right then. And so um, the notion that you need to have a PhD to ask questions is crazy. And that you just need to ask questions. And so that's part of the thing that we always try to get across to people is that the questions are important, you know? Um, I'm gonna buzz through these really quickly because um, I know we're out of time, but um, just, just a few other ones. Uh, you know, um, Titan is a moon around Saturn, and it was discovered that there were these lakes of methane and these methane lakes were just really crazy because the atmospheric pressure is high, but the gravity is low. And so um, thinking about how these, the water would move became sort of a very important part about it. And so um, also had just strange features. Uh, it's, this place in the circle is called the, the throat of Kraken. And so we had to do something about that. I mean, how could you not? Um, Europa has these amazing deep, deep oceans twice as much water as all of Earth, but it is a uh, size of the moon, like our moon. And so scientists are really interested in, in going to Europa, it's around Jupiter, and getting down into that ice and seeing if there's anything living there. Um, Jupiter, now going back into our solar system, has these enormous, enormous aurora, like the, the largest um, like northern lights in the entire solar system. And so we're imagining how, how could we be a part of that? How could we become, you know, what would we do if we would go there? And, and putting ourselves in the situation became um, sort of a central theme to all of these. Um, you know, Enceladus, another moon around Saturn, has these e tremendous geysers that are shooting out of the South Pole. And we were just constantly asking, um, what would it be like to be there? And, and um, somebody was talking earlier about sort of the idea of um, what it means to be human and uh, putting yourself in these places, um, even though it may feel like it's far off, all of a sudden sort of humanized it. Um, and the last one is, is uh, Earth. You know, we were kind of joking with this and we felt a little, we weren't sure which way to go, um, considering there's so many things happening to Earth now. Uh, 
So, but we, we chose the route of a, sort of an idealized version of Earth, but the undercurrent with this one was that uh, we thought it may have been because everybody left. <laughs> but, you know, we, so we said Earth, you know, it's uh, where the air is free and the breathing is easy. Um, I've always loved this uh, Ernest Shackleton, great, you know, British explorer, 100 year or so years ago, 100, made an ad to get men to join his crew um, to sail to Antarctica. And this was the advertisement he put in the newspaper. As men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success, Ernest Shackleton. And hundreds of people showed up. <laughs> and this goes back to, like, we fill in the gaps with our dreams, with our hope. Um, it's sort of, I feel what, like what humans are sort of meant to do. I think it's the reason why we've been so successful. Um, it's also uh, one of the things that keeps us going. Um, and I think that that hope and the dream of the future is something that we're also really meant to build. And that's why I'm so happy to be around everybody here. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, David. So um, we've come to the end of our expedition um, and the curtain falls. Uh, we're gonna ride off into the sunset. The car will barrel off a cliff and we have a rain-drenched kiss goodbye. We tuck ourselves into bed. We hold our Trumpy bears tight. Uh, we fall asleep to lullabies of bump stock rapid fire and nuclear apocalypse tweet taunts and sweaty men whispering in our ear. In such a world, perhaps these fictions are one of the only ways of saying sane, where fiction becomes a way of grasping with the world that realism struggles to grasp, where these stories of imagined lands help us to visualize other possible worlds that sit outside of the one that all too often feels inescapable. Um, so I hope that um, tonight's event was a kind of call to arms, a hope that we will all keep making stories that become vessels for critical ideas, Trojan horses hidden within the mediums of popular culture, because there'd be monsters off the map. Um, but the more we prototype new territories, the sites where they might dwell get even smaller. And the real voyage of discovery tonight perhaps consists in not in seeking out these new landscapes, but in uh, having new eyes. Um, and I wanna thank all our speakers um, from the entire event um, for leading us on this expedition and charting our course through this atlas of imagined worlds, uh, a collection of worlds of fear and wonder that were both thrilling and scary, but also necessary and urgent. Uh, thank you, thank you all for coming.